welcome to episode 390 of the Reformed Brotherhood. I'm Jesse. And I'm Tony, and we are proud members of the Society of Reformed Podcasters. The sky comes falling down for you. There's nothing in this world I wouldn't do. Hey, brother. Hey, brother. So we're starting a whole new conversation on this episode. It's true. I'm pretty stoked about this. It's true. And also, I don't know much about this. <laughs> it's true. I texted Jesse this afternoon. and was like, we're going to do this. You cool with that? He's like, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> so we're, we're, starting a, we're starting a quick series. Maybe it won't be quick, but it probably won't be too long. Too long. Who knows how long it'll be? Who knows? Uh, but we're going to run through uh, one of the lesser known but still super important confessions of the Reformed tradition called the Scots Confession. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit tonight about the history of the Scots Confession and its sort of historical situatedness, uh, where it came from. But, um, you know, I think we are quick to go to the Westminster and maybe a little bit less quick, but still quick to go to things like the Belgian Confession and the Heidelberg Catechism. We don't often, and we being Jesse and I, but also we being like the Reformed community as a whole, we don't often dig back further than that into some of the earlier confessional documents. So we thought it would be interesting to kind of go through the Scots Confession chapter by chapter, um, talk about the theology about how similar it is, and then some areas where it's a little bit different, and then maybe make some connections to how things have translated to us in the Westminster tradition. Uh, but I'm super excited about this. I really, really, really like the Scots Confession, and I wish that people used it more. And it's actually still a confession that is uh, subscribed to by substantial Reformed denominations in the world. So it's it's not as though this is just a historical confession that nobody uses anymore. There are churches that meet every week whose ministers subscribe and swear allegiance and an oath to to uphold the theology of the Scots Confession, just like there are ministers that swear that same kind of oath to the Westminster or to the Three Forms of Unity. So I'm stoked to get started. I'm really excited. I really, really like the Scots Confession. And we're pretty pro-confession generally on this podcast. We find that to be just helpful in setting boundaries and distilling down the essential teachings of the scripture. Of course, a good confession always drives you back to that same scripture by way of proof text and otherwise. And I think we're going to find a lot here. So we've actually never done this. So it's kind of interesting we're doing this with the Scots Confession because yeah. I don't think we've actually done this type of exercise where we said, let's just go through it almost line by line, just have some conversation in chat. One might think that we'd go to like, you know, the London Baptist or WCF. No, 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 no. How dare you? We're going to do the Scots Confession. In 390 episodes, this is where we finally decided <laughs> to start, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think this is also, this is kind of the outflow of a little passion project that I've wanted to do for many years now that I even started and stopped a couple of times that I was calling right. Reform Standard. Yes. And I think, you know, I wish I had time to do a hundred podcasts because I've always got ideas for podcasts. But I think this is one of those things that most Reformed uh, podcasts that kind of work in our, in our lane here, they do at some point. And you're right. Like people usually start with the big ones or they work through a catechism. Entire podcasts have, have started and ended going through the Westminster Shorter Catechism or the Westminster Lurker sure. Catechism. But you don't often run into some of these other more vintage, um, confessions compared to something like the Westminster. So let, let's, let's do our thing and let's get into it. But I think we have a little bit of business to take care of first. <laughs> Yeah, we do. I like the way that you said that. That sounds like very Scottish. I think kind of we're like being the hipster of confessions here by doing the Scottish. Like if if you had to slap a robust Tom Selleck mustache on a confession, <laughs> it would be this one. Do you know what I'm saying? I do. Yeah. I, 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 I picture someone like Tom Selleck when I think of the uh, <laughs> but like young Tom Selleck, not like not like older Tom Selleck. I don't really know old Tom yeah, Selleck. I, I don't just know why know I said with, that. I, yeah, with like the white blazer with yeah. the rolled up sleeves, which is kind of the Scots Confession. So anyway, sorry, you're <laughs> totally right. You were leading us to transition, which I uniformly rejected, but now accept. So it, I presume what you're talking about is affirmation denial. So let's we added a whole other section of this podcast <laughs> that I'm aware of. Maybe I did. So, Maybe I did. Yeah, it's, it's I, I did it. I did it. It's been a week. What do you want to start with first? Affirm or deny? Let's do affirmations because my first affirmation is super lighthearted. Get some. So I, I, I'm a little bit ashamed to say this, but as a, as a, a, a father of toddlers, 
or of a toddler. Toddlers? How many more children do you have that I do not know about? And th- there's zero more. Well, there's one more child uh, on the way here. But um, as a father of a toddler, I uh, am subjected to uh, the same songs all the time. Miss Rachel. Uh, well, no, yeah, yes, Miss Rachel, although not so much lately. Um, the YouTube algorithm thinks that I want nothing but uh, toddler music videos. Not so much music videos of toddlers, although those pop up too. But lately, my son August has really, really been into this Australian group called Bounce Patrol. Have you ever heard oh. of Bounce Patrol? I mean, just like like generally and by way of like in a laboratory because I'm I'm not like yeah. a big subscriber to Bounce Patrol. Yeah. So when Bounce Patrol first cropped up, there, there's this whole there's this whole history, right? There's Miss Rachel. And then Miss Rachel had on her, this is like six degrees of separation of kids music yeah. videos on YouTube. Miss Rachel had the Wiggles on her show. So we got hooked on the Wiggles. No doubt. And then the Wiggles had Bounce Patrol on their show. And so now we're hooked on Bounce Patrol. And this is, this is what I'll say. And I think most parents of toddlers will resonate with this. And I know there's a fair amount of them out there who listen to the show because I've gotten lots of emails and, and text messages and stuff. Bounce Patrol's goal is to make music that is your traditional nursery rhyme kinds of songs. Think like okay. Head, Shoulders, Knees, and Toes, Baby Shark. Um, these They have these five-finger songs. But to make them in a way that is catchy and modern enough that parents don't feel terrible listening to it. And yeah. I will say this. I know you and I don't always have the same taste in music, but some of their songs just totally slap. And... My okay. my phone, my iPhone thinks every time I turn the car on, my iPhone thinks I want to listen to acoustic, an acoustic coffee shop version of Baby Shark by Bounce Patrol. Yeah. And it's usually right. And that song plays at least That's once right. before I change it when I, I'm on my way to work. So if you have kids, if you don't have kids, if you've got a heart and you love music, check out Bounce Patrol because it's just fun. It's just good, fun music. Um, I don't know that you'd want to listen to it all the time. Uh, I kind of want to listen to it all the time, but it's, it's just good, fun music. It's, and, and seriously, if you have toddlers, if you have kids, one of the eternal struggles is like finding stuff on YouTube that isn't, uh, isn't just trash. And like, you don't have to worry about random stuff popping up. Bounce Patrol is eminently safe. Uh, they're a lot of fun, and the music actually is not terrible. They've done a pretty good job of of making these songs. They do like mashup songs, so they'll go from like you'll be singing Baby Shark, and all of a sudden it switches into a version of Wheels on the Bus go round and round, and then like it goes it. back to Baby Shark, and it's pretty seamless. So they're actually pretty talented musicians. Um, they're talented arrangement musicians. I don't know what you call it. It's not really a composer, arranger. Uh, yeah. They they put together really interesting arrangements. They have some original songs. So yeah, check them out. Bounce Patrols. It's where it's at. And and then you don't wake up with Miss Rachel stuck in your head. You wake up with Bounce Patrol stuck in your head. That's fair. You Someday I'll wake up without toddler music stuck in my head, but it's not this day. Yeah, that's not going to happen for quite some time. The, I think the Paragon here, the question, the relevant comparison is, how does this stack up against Pancake Robot? Uh, I think it's probably not musically as good as Pancake Robot, but I think Pancake Robot actually may not be something that most, my, my son does not like Pancake Robot. I tried playing what? it for him and he just was not into it. So does he like pancakes? He does like pancakes. Does he like robots? Does he know robots? I don't know if he likes robots. He may not understand what a pancake robot is though. Yeah. That, I mean, that's fair. I think the the harder part to identify with is the robot part. True. Yeah. And the pancake is like universally delicious. I think the big thing is he wants things that have a decent video component. It's not so much the music, it's the visual engagement. Um, And actually, I wasn't going to go into a whole long thing about Bounce Patrol other than the fact that affirmations and denials are like necessarily a whole long thing. (laughs) They actually are really smart about the way they do their videos. So they have several, there's five members in the band. And they have almost like assigned personas. So anytime there is a cow, it's the same person. No matter what the song is, no matter what the context is, it's the same person. Uh, The same person is always representing mommy shark and daddy shark. It's always the same person if there's color affinity. And it actually makes it really, I think it actually really helps kids to like recognize those things because it's, it's so consistent across the board. 
So I don't know. I don't know how it stacks up against Pancake Robot. I think I would probably rather listen to Pancake Robot most of the time, but I think that's my fair. son probably likes Bounce Patrol more. Oh, that's fair. Well, I mean, Pancake Robot might be an acquired taste. I think you've basically described something like the Spice Girls for children. Yeah, probably pretty close. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is great. But again, can we just file this under what a time to be alive? That like yeah. children get access to all kinds of, honestly, really great music. Yeah. That is illustrative, inspiring. It really commands their attention and is educational and also yeah. catchy. So, and we, we've long talked about God made noise by design. And that's to teach us, to illuminate us, to cause us to bring into our memory all the things that we're singing. So I'm totally down with this. And it seems like they're Australian. Is that correct? Yeah, they're, they're based in Australia. And at least at least two of them have, or three of them have Australian accents. One of them does not, and I can't tell if it's an American accent or a Canadian accent, but it's somewhere in North America. And one of them doesn't talk enough for me to know, but it does not sound Australian. So um, I think probably they're based in Australia and there's a couple transplants. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's part of that same like ecosystem of bounce patrol and the wiggles and whatever else happens. Yeah. I love it. Actually, it's a really great name, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it, there, there, I could, I mean, this is crazy, but I could talk about bounce patrol for quite a long time because I've spent a lot of time watching them <laughs> and I've actually observed a lot of things about education. You can tell they really put a lot of thought into how they do their videos to not just be fun music, but also to be yeah. educational and to help with learning like yeah, that's the key they do these five finger songs where it's like mama finger or daddy finger or whatever or grape finger or whatever um and actually like the family lines up with the baby shark family and they make sure it's the same characters the baby shark is also baby finger the mama shark is also mommy finger so they do a lot of really good rep you know repetition type stuff to help jesse is just laughing at me on the the video chat here I really could go on. And so I need you to stop me because otherwise I'm not. And this is no, going to be is, episode 390 on Bounce Patrol. That's fantastic. I, I love that you're just bringing all these arguments to like, again, emphasize the degree to which like they're being thoughtful about this and yeah. lining up and cooperating all these pieces. And of course, I'm like, yeah, of course, baby, baby finger. Let's do it. Yeah, awesome. baby finger. My favorite is when they do the old McDonald finger and it's chicken finger. That's my favorite part. When they say chicken finger, chicken that's finger, where are you? And I'm like, in my tummy. That's where chicken finger should be. Get in yeah, my belly. I would agree. Yeah. yeah so what funny. are you what are you affirming, Jesse? So we can please still, please move on to, from this. I'm still trying to come recover from bounce patrol. <laughs> you never well, recover from bounce patrol. That's wow. Yeah, that's a really, I think, strong heuristic right there. Mine is also music related. It's um, I don't know if the story will translate, but uh, this morning. Uh, right before in the Lord's Day, when before we uh, partake in the worship service together, the people who are participating and leading in music, we always have a time of prayer, like right before. And it's amazing because it's like, I, I, that, I feel like that's in many ways, like it's the the boiler, which I know AJ appreciates a good boiler. Like sure. it's the boiler room. It's like where all the energy and the action happens. It's this praying for what's about to take place and praying over the preaching and praying over the music. I love this. And so we have this amazing time of prayer. It's always filled with energy and power. I think the Holy Spirit is always always so kind and gracious to meet us in that moment because we're sensing a need to depend upon him and we're sensing that we're about to go into a place that's where we want to be reverent and we want to worship unreservedly. And we know that just like the psalmist we need, we're asking God to open our mouths and fill it with his praise. All that happens, we finish the time of prayer. And then this uh, lovely sister, who I would say, I only bring up her age because I just think this is funny in relation to the context of what I'm about to say. She's probably like mid-60s. She's not old by any means, but of a certain age. And so she says to us, so I just have to share. I've been listening to this piece of music, um, but I'm hesitant to share what it is because I think like the lyrics might be kind of strange. And, and, and of course, everybody like leaned in at that point. We're in a circle. I know, but everybody's kind of leaning into like, what is this? worship song that you've been listening to and, and singing with and she goes the song is called to hell with the devil and she's like i'm really resonating with this like the power of this so i say like immediately so like oh you're listening to striper and she goes uh i don't think so the song is called to hell with the devil and i'm like no no that's that's definitely this christian band called like striper like heavy metal kind of like kind of ish 80s kind of rock heavy hair metal striper she's like no it's definitely not that 
So I was like, I'm pretty sure it's that. She's like, no, I don't recognize that. And it's more like pop. And I'm like, no, uh, like there's guitars, like a solo, like, you know, like harmonic guitar riff. She's like, no, they're playing that. I'm like, it's Striper. No, it's not Striper. So like we just agree to disagree. And then we literally like go on to like into the sanctuary to lead worship. So when I got home, I sent her through Spotify, like the link to Striper. And I was like, I, this is the song you're speaking of. Like, you know, this is what you're talking about. So she's like, actually, no, she sends it back to me. And it turns out I'm the one that doesn't know what I'm talking about. So apparently, uh, King and Country has done like a straight up remix of Stripers to Hell with the Devil, which includes Rick Lecrae. And the, but the chorus is exactly Striper. So this is amazing to me. So like they've turned Striper, which is fine, into like this kind of pop version of Hell with the Devil. But the melody is all the same. The lyrics are definitely the same, with the exception of like Lecrae, who's inserted his own rap, which I have some feelings, but it doesn't matter. So the thing is, I guess I'm affirming with like that this song is present. I love the kind of the biblical mandate that's in this song. And I think I, I said to her, like, I'm totally fine theologically with singing these lyrics to hell with the devil. And I, I, I'm also affirming like the original by Striper because I listened to it today several times. I mean, my wife listened to it several times only because I forgot how like operatic the lyrics are in the original Striper version. I think it's just impressive, full stop. Doesn't matter what what style you're into. Yeah. I also was, was thinking there was a time where I thought like Striper was like prolifically heavy in its music. And <laughs> I, I don't think that anymore, uh, just because of my by way of comparison right. with some of the other things I've affirmed on this podcast. But go listen to all of them so you can find either the King and Country version, which apparently is called To Hell with the Devil, uh, parentheses, Rise. From the from the inspired by soundtrack soundtrack unsung hero, I'm not familiar with with those things, but maybe it's part of a movie. I don't know. Our our listeners are screaming, and they can educate me at inspiredformbrotherhood.com. But it, this is just a classic song. It just cracks me up that I mean, past like 20 years here, somebody else is remixing it, and it's King and Country. Who are they? Australian? I, I don't even know who that is. I think they might be. I don't I, actually, listen to any music that people? doesn't doesn't have some sort of children's element to it these days. So unless well, they were guests on Miss Rachel at some point or possibly maybe went to Sesame Street and sang there, I'm I'm at a loss. They might they might be. I just loved how this unfolded where this is like really polite demure woman was like, uh, I'd love to like there's this song that's really been I've been worshiping with this week. <laughs> But I'm kind of hesitant to t- say the title. And then she's like, Hell with the Devil. And I was like, yeah, that's like a like 90s, 80s, like a hair metal band. She's like, no. She no. was like, listen, Junior. No. <laughs> I know what I'm talking about. This is not metal. It's not metal at all. Turns out she was right. So I'm affirming uh, Sonya and also Striper to Hell with the Devil and apparently King and Country. It's just a great song. But apparently not Lecrae rapping in the middle of it, if I'm reading between the lines here. <laughs> I, so so here's my thought about it. So you have to understand, like, I grew up, like, listening to the Striper version of this. So yeah. it's a bit like Chris Tomlin. I was just going to say that. Inserting, yeah, his own chorus. It's not that I'm against it per se. It's just kind of like, yo, you don't need to do that. Maybe you were not aware that there was, like, an awesome version of this done with people just headbanging to it. So... Again, I can't say anything, but affirming the song generally, both versions, go listen to it. I actually feel like maybe we'll have listeners that will identify with one or either version, but probably somebody will identify with one or the other and we'll get like full coverage on this. So that kind of makes me happy. Are you familiar with this? Were you familiar with that song? I wasn't. No, no. So like, I think probably there's a big gap in my Christian uh, music knowledge because if you go any earlier than DC Talk, And, uh, so like I came into the Christian rock scene, uh, when I became a Christian in 1998 and like Jesus freak, some kind of zombie, like that was like DC talk and, um, and audio adrenaline and news was like the height of their fame before they all combined to become, to become the mega Christian group that is now, I think it's Newsboys, but it's like Newsboys plus DC talk plus audio adrenaline. Um, (laughs) That's like the Voltron of, of Christian music. Um, so if you go any earlier than Jesus freak, 
Um, or, or if it's not an earlier album from one of those kinds of people, like I went back and listened to all those people's earlier albums. I didn't get into any of the earlier stuff like Striper or, um, Petra or even like some of the, oh, the those ones. So maybe I should go back and listen to them at some point. Yeah, you should. This, this album came out in 1986. So I myself was only six years old, so I wasn't listening to it in real time, but there will some, there are some who are listening who will know that like Striper is kind of held up as like a kind of the, among the first right. to put like Christian music on the map in this way. That is like yeah. this kind of music in the Christian sense wasn't a sub genre or like suboptimal or like just mediocre compared to anything else. So anyway, that's enough said. Go listen to this song. I, I'm actually nervous that when you search it, you're going to come up with King Country, which is fine, which is fine. Listen, listen to it nonetheless. But if you want to hear the real deal, uh, it was Striper. So I did send this to my good friend and uh, she was listening to it and she said she listened to it on a walk this afternoon and enjoyed it immensely. And I wanted to say that's because it's Christian metal that's and funny. you're welcome. I just have this image in my head. Do you remember that old, uh, it was this sort of like satire video of that guy that was like, leave Britney alone. Do you remember that video? <laughs> yes. I just have this video in my mind, this this picture in my mind of Jesse who's like, leave Amazing Grace alone, leave Striper alone, and just like really mad that people are messing. They're just adding raps and choruses to songs that don't deserve them, don't need to have them. Just just listen to the original. In fairness, maybe I don't need to defend them because I when I just re-looked up this new version by King & Country, I see that the participating artists are, of course, King & Country, Lecrae, and Striper. Yeah. So apparently they're in there somewhere. I don't know where they are, Maybe it's in like just the background guitar, but it's definitely King Country. So if you're a fan of King Country, which I, I like them as well, I just didn't know they remixes. I think that says something about like the weight and the gravity of the song, though, that like, again, these many years later, over 20 years later, yeah. it's being remixed in kind of a pop way. That's super clear. But the chorus is like note for notes, the same melody. So I love that. So again, it just shows. And this is like kind of an anthem song. So I love that she was a little bit hesitant to share with us, but I wanted to affirm to her, like, no, I, I would sing this. Like, we could go do this right now if you want to, like for the congregation. We could just, there's not that many lyrics. This, the chorus is to hell with the devil. So we could just put those five words on the PowerPoint and lead the congregation in this masterful worship. I just think it's funny that through through this roundabout way, somehow you have caused this woman who I'm reading between the lines, but seems to be, perhaps a little bit more old. Uh, sure. Somehow you have convinced her to walk, to go on a walk and listen to Christian metal music and is now edified by that. It's just a very strange amalgamation of yeah. things. Well, this this last thing I'll say because uh, time wanes on here. So uh, she is like, one of the things I appreciate about my sister Sonia here is like, she just loves music. She is like equal opportunity in trying to listen to and uh, I'd like just take in new music. So like this several weeks ago, she had started a text thread with all of the people who are participating and leading the worship through music on that Lord's day. And <laughs> <laughs> did you see that? I did. Uh, okay. I have to describe what just happened here because so I feel like maybe this is going to end up on YouTube as a real encounter with a ghost here. Jesse and I use Google Meet as our uh, video medium here. And it's not unusual uh, for Jesse's wife to pop in during a recording to right. drop off a sandwich or a beer or a glass of water or whatever it is that Jesse happens to need. And so very, very discreetly in the background of Jesse's video, and actually we record the video of this, so we may have to put that up here. All of a sudden, the door to the room that Jesse is in creaked. Oh, did it creak? It sounded like it creaked. Oh, yeah. Did you hear that? I heard it. It creaked open. And I'm waiting for his wife, Jen, to pop in because that's not an unusual occurrence. But then I see Jesse look over his shoulder and it was kind of like, I'm not anticipating anything. And the door just popped open. So I shut that door like that door was latched. Yes. It's to protect, like, this is a private environment. We can't, I can't even have my wife hear this stuff before it's released. I mean, she won't listen to it when it's released, but she can't, nobody can hear it before it's released. This is like secretive. I feel like Brian and the light just came on. So ghost, ghost haunting confirmed. 
I feel like Brian Suave or Suave or whatever his name is over at Haunted Cosmos is going to need to be called in on this because yeah. oh. your 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 house is haunted and it's probably it's probably the Nephilim or maybe it's Bigfoot. I'm not sure what it is, but you got to get out of there. You got to get out of there right now. Yeah. Listen, I know I was mid story. We just got to move on at this point. Well, say say that for another time. What what are you denying against? Well, I, I'll 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 do my best to keep this short. I'm denying this is a silly denial because it's in the midst of a very happy occasion. Uh, my wife and I just purchased our first home, which is amazing, and we're super excited. Uh, but the the process of purchasing a home is the most ridiculous, complicated, stupid, and archaic process that there ever was and and maybe yeah, ever right. will be. So I, I don't want to get into all the details, but there are so many weird things that you have to do and say and sign and agree to when you purchase a home. It's very, very strange. The lawyer actually had to say to me, by signing this, you are pledging this property to the bank. And I was <laughs> like, I'm pledging? Like, am I a, am I a serf on a on a farm in England in the, the 1400s here. So it's a very strange process. I, I think homeownership, although I've only been a homeowner for two days now, uh, homeownership is great. Property is great. It, God has created us to, uh, to cultivate the land and to take dominion and owning land and property and, and all that stuff is part of that. But yeah, the mortgage process and the the signing process, it's just a very strange, weird thing that has to happen. Yeah. If you know, you know. So if you go through the process or work in the process somehow, you'll quickly come to understand there's like so much that's archaic about it. Like you're kind of yeah. getting a lesson in history Yes. about like the way things used to work when everything was on paper and paper had to move around and titles had to be verified and there had to be insurance against those titles. So I think if you go into the first time, you're thinking things like, well, I can like send money all around the world relatively easily, or I can yeah. just use my debit card to transfer and purchase property of all kinds that's not like real estate relatively easily, or even like relatively large things. Like I can just go to a dealership and walk out with a car in basically like 45 minutes. How is it that it's so complicated and there's so many rules and so many fees and so many different parts of buying real estate? It is a wild process. Now, I'm like super thankful for real estate law for protection that allows us yeah. to be able to purchase a property and not have somebody just come and claim it. But you would think that this day and age would be simple to justify that and to transfer it. And the bottom line is it really just is not. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's very weird. Like you have to, they have to do this search to make sure nobody else owns the property. Um, I, thankfully we didn't run into this, but like squatter law has like, it's all this different stuff that, that plays into, who actually owns? I mean, we didn't purchase property. We purchased we we purchased a manufactured home that sits in a, a leased land. So we didn't purchase land, which would have added a whole different element of complexity to it. But you have to. There's all this stuff that the lawyers have to do to make sure that like the building is free and clear, that nobody else has a claim on the building. They have to appraise it, and the bank has to understand how much it's worth, and they won't sign off on the mortgage unless it's worth a certain amount. And um, you you. If if you want to understand ancient Near Eastern suzerainty treaties and covenants, then maybe buy a house because it's very, very similar kinds of things. They didn't quite make me cut animals in half and walk through them, but I felt like maybe, maybe it was pretty close to that. There was a fair amount of maledictory oaths that had to happen in, uh, in the signing of this documentation that uh, it felt very much like I was swearing fealty to some sort of like, some sort of like conquering hero or something. Yeah. And of course, like once you have a mortgage involved, it's all the more complicated. And for good reason, lots of institutions got in trouble for granting mortgages to people that really shouldn't have mortgages and for pulling the wool over people's eyes. And so, of course, there's a lot more rules. Hence the whole like you realize that this property you're collateralizing, like the bank can come and take the, the property, right. the house, if you do not pay your loans, which I think for the average person is like, uh, yeah, that's I totally get that. What, what are we doing here? That's not exactly what I'm I'm doing. So. I'm with you. It's an incredible process. It's great to go through. And of course, it's it's pretty modern, as modern as it can be, but maybe not as modern as it should be. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that if the bank goes to war with another bank, then I'm required to answer the call to arms. I think I think that was in there somewhere. And also, I think the bank owns a certain amount of the produce of my land. Uh, I think. But, uh, but I think maybe... 
uh, my firstborn son is entitled to marry the president of the pres of the bank's firstborn daughter if I want to. Wow. So it's a pretty good mortgage, I think. That's <laughs> so, <laughs> sounds like it. That's some like brave heart mortgage. It's true. Craziness. Yeah. Yeah. I had to yeah. swear a certain number of goats uh and, and the eggs for certain years. So no, I'm joking. And we have a very good lender. The lenders were great. I mean, the, the process was actually relatively straightforward. There's just a lot of weird features that happen. You sit down with the lawyer and the lawyer has to explain what these documents mean. Yes, that's true. And the way they have to explain them and the phrases they have to use, you're like, really? You like it's just very strange. It's hard to even explain unless you've been through the process, but you're right. If you've been through the process, you know. then you understand what I'm saying. And I know for a fact there are people who listen to the show who are also recent home purchasers. So it'd be interesting to chat about that sometime. You could join our, our Telegram chat, t.me slash Reform Brotherhood. We can chat about our, our interesting mortgage experiences. And what's funny is the, the, the lawyer who was doing our closing was telling us how difficult sometimes these closing sessions get between the buyers and the right. sellers. He said he's actually had fist fights break out in the middle of these, these uh, things. And I'm like, man, that's crazy. Thing. Our seller wasn't even there. She came in and signed the night before, and then we just yeah. came in and signed our stuff. But uh, I guess it can get pretty dicey. It can. I can tell you, we don't have time. I can tell all kinds of stories about this kind of thing. It's, it's unusual, I'd say for the most part, for the buyer and the seller to be present in the same room because... It can get a little contentious yeah. sometimes, especially if there are contingencies which should have been accomplished and there's a dispute about the accomplishment of those yeah. contingencies. But all kinds of things. It's, again, what a blessing to live in the world that we do where there is a full and clear transfer, but there's lots of little rules and yeah. little nuances to that process. So congratulations to you. It's always great to be able to have a place for God to give us a place to root our families and to be able to, of course, like, the thing about property like that is it offers you the service of a great place to live, memories to make, and a family to raise. And that is an incredible blessing. So congratulations to you, brother. Thank you, sir. What are you denying today before we move on to our topic? All right, super quick. And I was going to say, like, this would be lighthearted. It's not lighthearted. It probably won't be super quick because you and I are going to be tempted to wade into this. Tony, we cannot do that. We just have to. <laughs> we, just, we just have to take what I say. And just move on because it, we're already at a 31 minute mark. So I was just thinking today as I was listening to uh, some some different kind of sermons and talks, not from my pastor, from others. There's nothing wrong with this, but I, I was just thinking about some of the language that we use when we talk about Christ. We talk about Christians. We often say believers, and then we often say like those who believe in Christ or believers in Christ or if you believe in Christ. And I just thought, man, I get what we're saying with that. But I think rather than saying like, when you say like believe in Christ, it's like you're saying like believe in Santa, like if yeah. Jesus is real, if Christ is real, if he actually existed. And I, I think it would just be really hard to prove. Again, there's no time. It'd be really hard for somebody to be like, well, I just don't believe Jesus ever lived. Like that seems like that's just a nonsensical statement yeah. these days. I think most people would recognize that. Most, not all. But this idea of like believing in Jesus seems weird. I think what we're really saying is if you believe who Jesus says he was. Like, that's the critical distinction there. It's not like yeah. if he lived, if he was a man, if he walked to earth, even if he did these things. But do you believe that Jesus is who he said he was, that he is the son of God, that you need this representative, this intermediary to make a way for you so that you may be purified, cleansed, redeemed, restored, if you believe he is necessary and who he is, who he says he was. Not if he exists or in him in the way that he, of course, existed in this world. So my denial maybe is against that language because I think some of that, that does trip up the so-called unbelievers, whatever yeah. we mean by that. Because it really, I think in this day and age, it's beyond debate that Jesus lived. Really, our question is, do we need a savior? Is he the son of God? Is he doing this that he, the thing he said he did? Is he the one who rises from the dead? Even like the raising from the dead, I think it's just hard to disprove this, like logically for lots of different reasons. Really what we're saying is, do you believe he is the son of God, which is more about his identity and less about his existence. So that's my denial. Yeah. Yeah. I almost feel like, um, although this is one of those things where like, you can't just change the language, people you would revolt. But um, it, it would be almost better if we said the, the receivers, like if we use that language yeah. instead of the believers, because when we look at the, we look at how the Bible talks about faith and belief. And when we look at how the reformed tradition has understood that faith is a resting and receiving of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. So if instead of talking about believers in Christ or those who believe Christ, if we talked about those who receive Christ or the receivers of Christ, 
I think that would clear up a lot of things because there are a lot of people and a lot of, I mean, not just, not just humans. There are a lot of demons who believe that Jesus Christ existed. Of course. Um, the, the demons in the gospels were the first people to recognize who Jesus was, at least as far as it's been handed down to us in the, the written accounts. Um, they were among the first uh, intelligent entities to recognize that Jesus was the son of God. But if we started to talk about those people, maybe this is a linguistic revolution we can start on the Reformed Brotherhood. If we talked about the receivers or the, belie- the, the, the those who've received Christ rather than just believers or followers or something like that. There are even a lot of people that I would say we could we could say follow Christ to a certain extent or in a certain way that are not uh, not followers of Christ in the way that we would mean when we talk about that phrase. So right. I hear you. We we could we could and, and should it. at some point go on, I but know. we need We're to just it. move forward. We're doing the thing that I, I said we shouldn't do, and I'm about to contribute to it for about 30 seconds more. So I'm I'm totally with you. It, I, can I just say everybody should go back and listen to the last like two or three episodes where you talked about John three sixteen. I yeah. think that's exactly in the same vein of everything you're saying. So I do take issue, not necessarily umbrage, but issue. And I've made this kind of remarks in my past as well. So I'm not trying to slam dunk on anybody else. This idea of again, when you hear people say like, "Well, I found Christ," or at this age, I found Christ, and I want to say like, "Did you though, or did God find you?" Like, so I like this idea of like we are receivers. This is a gift. And when we find something, it's only because like we've been given sight and where did that sight come from? So I'm totally with you. And I'm just kind of denying against this idea of like, I think it's more confusing for those who are outside of the faith and those who are inside. Because when you hear people constantly saying like, are you a believer? I believe in Christ. All people hear, or maybe some of what people hear rather, is they're comparing that against other things which seemingly require some kind of hope against hope or this like ir- like irrational faith. That's what it means like to believe in something. Yeah. And so I think oftentimes that just confuses the fact we're talking about logic. We're talking about facts. We're talking about Jesus. And so by virtue of that, what we really mean is that we're believing that he is who he said he was yeah. and continues to be. So actually that's not a bad lead in because I'm looking at the first part of this God's confession here. And like many, it starts with identity. That like that's a critical part of what it means to be a Christian, understanding who we are, but more importantly, who we are in light of who God yeah. is. And so that's where we find this first article pointing us. So let's get into it. Yeah. Yeah. I think before we talk about that, I just want to read a little brief portion of the actual like introduction or preface to the confession that was attached to it. So the Scots Confession um, was the formal confession of the church in Scotland, um, which for the most part was all of Scotland. There wasn't, uh, there wasn't a huge, once, once the Reformation took hold in Scotland, it wasn't like some of the other countries that we see in the Reformation where there was this lots of back and forth. Once it took hold, it took hold. Um, and so this is the, this is the beginning of the preface. I'm not going to read the whole thing. But it's it's titled The Confession of Faith. It was written by John Knox, which you know it's going to be good when it's written by John Knox. Yeah, John Knox. And it says, The Confession of Faith, professed and believed by the Protestants within the realm of Scotland, published by them in Parliament and by the estates thereof, ratified and approved as wholesome and sound doctrine, grounded upon the infallible truth of God's Word. And then it goes on to say here, The estates of Scotland, with the inhabitants of the same, professing Christ Jesus, his holy gospel, to their natural countrymen and to all other realms and nations professing the same Lord Jesus with them, which grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ with the spirit of righteous judgment for salvation. So the Scots Confession is um, not utterly unique, but in terms of how we normally think about confessions, the Scots Confession is a little bit different in that the purpose of it is not so much polemic, which a lot of confessional statements are polemic, but they actually are going into this confession saying, not only is this our confession, but we're intending this confession to be a proclamation of gospel of the gospel to other Christians in other nations who also trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think sometimes Scottish theology, and for good reason, but Scottish theology gets this sort of like cantankerous uh, reputation of like, 
the Scots are this crank, and this is not intended to sound racist, although as I'm thinking it, it sounds a little bit racist. The Scots, in terms of Scottish theology, are sort of seen as like this cranky, angry people who are always like fighting against something or someone. You know, like like we said earlier, like Braveheart theology. It's like right. it's like William Wallace uh, actually is the model for Scottish theology. And John Knox doesn't help that, right? John Knox is the guy who carries her on a broadsword and and is, um, you know, makes the queen cry and writes about the thunderous judgment against the, you know, wicked tyranny of women or something like that. But the Scots Confession, which John Knox wrote, is actually intended to be a unifying confession, not just within the estates of Scotland, but a unifying confession outside of those boundaries as well. And the Scots Confession was the official confession of Christians in Scotland for almost a hundred years. And it wasn't until the Westminster Confession was ratified and, and promulgated that this actually was replaced by the Westminster Confession in Scotland. So it's a significant um, confession. And it's it's important because although the Westminster does represent kind of like the culmination and pinnacle, although the Baptists that are listening to our show are going to freak out when I say this, but it's the pinnacle of of biblical confessionalism in English speaking countries, the Scots confession is deeply, deeply uh, concordant with the Westminster confession. It's not directly in its lineage, but it has a huge amount of affinity that we really should recognize. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I mean, I think that's helpful in terms of understanding like the context into which it dropped into the world as it were. So there's a lot in here that's like direct. It's right. forthright. And that's maybe not unusual for these kinds of things for a confession or a creed. But I, I like your idea of like there's a missional purpose in some ways. Yeah. So you can hear that kind yeah. of come through as we talk about this over and over again. Like the explic- explanation and enumeration of who God is is meant to be comforting and illustrative and educational in many ways not necessarily meant to be argumentative, but of course, like truth must be absolute by its very definition. Yeah. And so you're going to find that, but I think that's helpful because it's not, as you said, like Paul Mick coming against other argumentation meant to refute certain ideals or principles, but really meant to educate, meant to be missional. Yeah. So I'm going to read the first chapter here. The chapters are actually usually pretty small. Um, Some of them are a little bit longer. We may either break those into two episodes or we may, um, we may just not read the whole thing. But one of the interesting features of the Scots Confession, um, and this isn't, this is not like, this isn't a huge deal, but it's an interesting way that it's printed and that it's recorded, is um, the the proof texts for the confession usually are not individual verses, which I really like, but also they are embedded within the text. And so as I read the chapter, I'm actually going to read the proof text quotation or the citation along with it. So chapter one is titled Of God, and it reads, we confess and acknowledge one only, only one only God to whom we must cleave, whom only we must serve, Deuteronomy 6, whom only we must worship, Isaiah 44, and in whom we must put our trust, Deuteronomy 4, who is eternal, infinite, immeasurable, incomprehensible, omnipotent, invisible, one in substance and yet distinct in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, Matthew 28, by whom we confess and believe all things in heaven and earth, Genesis 1, as well as visible and invisible, to have been created, to be retained in their being, and to be ruled and guided by his inscrutable providence, to such end as his eternal wisdom, Proverbs 16, goodness and justice has appointed them to the manifestation of his own glory. So this this chapter is so packed with meaning and importance. Right. Um, when we look at later confessions, they break this same topic out into much, into usually two or three or sometimes more sections that are equal in length to really unpack this. But this is such a great, like, concise statement of what it is that the Bible teaches about the very nature and essence of God. Yeah, and again, like as I remarked at the top, what I find interesting is there might be many, many places to start with such a thing, but. I find it, again, very interesting and helpful that where this starts is in God's identity, all these characteristics of God, and then those characteristics immediately leading us to what kind of response we ought to have to those very things. So it starts with the idea of confessing. I like that. We confess. So this idea that together we make this acknowledgement that there is only one God, which, of course, is very Deuteronomy 6, right? The Lord your God is one. 
So this is just more modern language about that. But what I find interesting, and I think this is somewhat different than like the tact and like the initial kind of ground setting that many other confessions have, this idea of we must cleave, we must only serve, we must only worship, and we only put our trust in those verbs I actually find unique to this particular confession. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's true. And every time I've worked my way through the Scott's confession in whatever context I'm working through it, that's something that I come back to time and time again, is that this confession doesn't just start with, um, and in many ways, this is actually, um, it would be interesting to trace out the way that this has worked into it. This is this is probably Calvin's influence on John Knox, right? John Knox is the principal author of this confession, and he was actually recalled from Geneva to... So John Knox was under persecution. Some of it was probably because of his, his Reformed faith. Some of it was because John Knox was a little bit of a jerk um, and made the wrong people angry. But he fled to Geneva when he was being, being persecuted, and he was recalled back to Scotland to um, in order to write this. And you can sort of see like the influence. I don't know the timing of all of this, but you can see how the first chapter of the Institutes where Calvin is talking about the knowledge of God and the knowledge of man and how those two things are interrelated and how you can't have true knowledge of one without one without true knowledge of the other. You can see that influence here is that we can't even really talk about God in abstract without recognizing that this God that we're talking about is, is first of all, he's actual and exists but that we owe allegiance to him, that our knowledge of who God is entails our subservience and our uh, our allegiance to and our, our service to this one God. And I think we're going to see similar kinds of things throughout this confession, where there are there are phrases that um, they don't they don't surprise us, but they're not common in other confessional documents. We'll see there are phrases, there are ways of handling reformed theology that isn't it's not at odds with with the broader stream of reformed theology but it comes at it from a different angle and from a different direction or from a slightly different perspective and that's part of why i like the scott's confession so much is there are these little things that you know we work on memorizing the westminster shorter catechism i think that's something reformed folks do on a regular basis we work on those catechism questions so we're very familiar with like the flow of theology how question 1 leads to question 2 leads to question 3 and there's this internal logic to the catechism the scots confession is hitting all of the same points and it's starting in a lot of the same places but the the order of logic is slightly different and so it makes us think about it a little differently And so this starts out not just talking about God's nature and his essence and his attributes in abstract, but it starts by talking about how there's one God and we are to serve him. And then it talks about who this one God is and what he's like. And I think that's a major feature of this. And and that was obviously very intentional on Knox's part. Yeah. And usually when you get then to that identity part, we're quick to go to basically the distinct three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, I'm going Matthew 20, as you noted. Which, of course, is appropriate. What I find interesting is, like you said, after, like antecedent, actually, to like all of this identity is that if there is one God, right. then you must cleave to him, you must serve him, you must worship him, it establishes, you must trust him, all that gets established. But this idea that then after that, let's talk about who this God is, that he's eternal, infinite, immeasurable. And here's the thing that I think is somewhat unique, incomprehensible. Yes. So it's starting to say, well, let's talk about who God is, but also from the very beginning, say like there are boundaries and margins, which we cannot conceive of. We don't even know where they are. We can't even map them out. We can't even say like, well, beyond this point, there are things we don't understand. We don't even know where those points are. So there's this like really massive amount of humility while at the same time saying God is all powerful. He's invisible. Here is the one in substance. So by the time you get to these things where he's talking about the three persons, Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, you're already been prefaced with this idea that God cannot be understood well, here's a document to try to help us understand God. So like there's this really lovely tension in there. There's this like built-in humility, which I think is present in most creeds and confessions, but all the more so for the Scots one up front. And again, starting with like, it almost starts with practicality and action first. Yeah. And then here is why you act in this way, because God is all of these things. And so that, again, I think kind of flips our logic, like you said, on its head or turns it around. 
because it says like, you don't even need to understand who all of God is to know that you ought to obey him. You don't need to understand all of his immeasurable qualities in order to bow down and worship him. You don't need to understand exactly all of his characteristics and his infinite substance by means of knowing that you ought to trust him. So this is kind of like, you know, presuppositional in its approach here. It's just saying like, this is the truth about the world. And so we can't describe all the things instead of trying to emphasize all the things we ought to want to try to describe and know, let's start with all the ways we ought to behave because what we do know for sure is that God is over all things, that he is worthy of our praise and worship, that we have to cleave and serve him. And so as a result of that, we start there. So this is like, to me, kind of, I want to say like a reversal. Maybe this is the right way to think about it, but it is a different way to think about it. Yeah. And I think, you know, one of the things that we, I don't know, maybe this is like a, a distinctive of our show is that we come to these different series and we often end up following lines of thinking that is very different than what we would anticipate, just sort of like yeah. looking at the show title. And I think one of the things that we're going to see here is that the Scots Confession, because it is a little bit of an earlier form of Reformed theology, it's not this fully refined version that we get in the Westminster Confession, we see these like these glimpses of a different way of thinking about theology than what we're used to. And again, it's it's not as though there's anything in this confession. Um, there are some things in this confession that may flow at a slightly perpendicular direction than what we're used to, especially for most modern Americans who the version of the Westminster Confession that we're used to is the 1788 version, right. um, not the 1646, even though that is what we tend to have on our hats or if we got tattoos on our hands, um, what we would probably get is 1646. But the reality wow. is that the, the the big influence on us in terms of the Westminster Confession is the 1788 revision, which has some serious differences um, in terms of the, the relationship between the church and the state. We are not going to get any sort of hint in the Scots Confession that the church and state are not intertwined. Um, the, the preface is very clear that this is, is a state sponsored confession of faith. And those right. one of the estates of parliament has to do with the church. Like there, there are elements of state and church that is very different to our ears and to our, our, our sensibilities. But I actually think that's not a bad thing. Because I do think, um, and this goes back to when we were having conversations in our systematic theology series about church-state relations and different models of two-kingdom theology, all that stuff. I think that modern Reformed theology in, in its broadest expressions has swung too far to the church doesn't talk to the state. The church doesn't interact with the state. The church has nothing to do with or to say to the state. Now, again, there are now, there's a, a overcorrection to that in Christian nationalism, where now the church and the state are much more intertwined in a lot of ways. Right. But I think the Scots Confession, one of the things we're going to see is that that's not even necessarily, that's an assumed element of this, that the church and the state are working together for God's glory. That that's, that's the purpose of the state and the purpose of the church. And they both have the same purpose in a certain sense even though they come at them from different directions. And I'm really looking forward as we unpack this to see some of these um, unusual and unexpected features that we maybe have not uh, approached before. So I think this is going to be a great series. I'm really, really stoked about it. You know, the, the theology proper of the Scots Confession is not in any way different than what you're used to and what we've talked about in the Westminster Confession, right? It affirms all the same things, eternality, infinite, immeasurable, incomprehensible, right. even though that language isn't as prominent in some of the other Reformed confessions. The exactly. idea that God cannot be fully comprehended is definitely a part of the, the rest of the Reformed tradition. So right. it's not as though we're going to encounter things that are truly unique or truly um, distinct from the Reformed world, but we're going to encounter a different way of approaching this. And perhaps a more primitive form of some of these things that I think will, will force us to and give us the opportunity to really think about them in a different way. Yeah. And it might be, as you're saying, so primitive is, is kind of a good word. I would say like, it's, it's also, let's say like unfiltered. You're talking about a single person. You're talking about JK rocking this out, right? right. Not JK Rowling, but like, I mean, John she Lawrence. probably rocks this out too. She's probably <laughs> a member of the church of Scotland. If I think about it. <laughs> oh, that, could, that could be. 
And so I think what you're seeing here is something that there's a lot of intellect and brilliance in being able to distill down through a single person all of these ideas. But it is a unique expression, and it's going to be one that cannot be divorced or dislocated from time, culture, context. So I think that's all helpful. All of this is good to help us, like again, analyze, understand what the Bible teaches. And here, what you're being given, of course, is one man's systematic understanding of that teaching with all of the proper proof text. So I agree with you. I think what we have, I find here is some like unique arrangement of these principles, ideas, theology, and doctrines in a way that's slightly, I think what you said was pretty good, like octagonal too, maybe the ways that we've seen it or we're comfortable with it in other confessions, nothing that's heretical, but we might be able to get a sense for like, what's the flavor here? Like the uniqueness, the spiciness, the different kind of, I don't know, like preparation that's going into trying to explain this. That itself is worthwhile, worth exploring, especially when it's undervalued as I think it often is in the Scots Confession. So you're right. Like we're going to find the same principles of understanding who God is, who we are, how we understand certain key and critical pieces of like the closed handed, if you will, theological perspective. But I think there's a lot here that's different and that at least like will cause you to say like, hold on a second, like let's pause about that. Let's see, why is it occurring here? Why is it being said right now? And yeah. even in this very first like article, I think there's a lot in here that you get. You get this practicality up front, a definition of who God is. And then out of that identity of who God is, speaking about what he's created, what he retains, what he manifests and maintains in the world, how his providence rules and guides all things, how it's inscrutable, how it cannot be questioned. It's above and beyond that. So we get the exaltation, the loftiness of God. But what I love about this is it really starts with, here is what you owe God. Before we even talk about who God is, you just owe God. Right. And what you owe him is your service, your worship, a cleaving. I love that word. Cause that's really yes. unique, obviously, right? We're talking about like forsaking other things and grabbing hold of this truth, like with reckless abandon, like forsaking everything else. And then trust comes even after that cleaving. These are two separate things that are being enumerated here. They're worthy of a distinction that's being made. I think what we're going to find is so many different, just like that language, thought provoking things where we might be like, oh yeah, like totally down with it. That makes sense. I've heard this all before, but the question is, have you, have you heard it in this way? And I think we're going to continue to turn over those rocks and find that, oh yeah, there are familiar bugs. I don't know. It got weird. Yeah. Familiar things underneath those rocks, but also like new species or slightly different genus. And we're going to say, wow, these things are worth studying. They're different yeah. than I thought I was going to find when I turned it over. Yeah. Yeah. One last thing, and then we can wrap up this this week, is the other thing about the Scots Confession that I think makes it worth um, investigating, and, and one of the reasons I'm excited to spend a, devote a bit of time to, fair amount of time to, this is going to be a, a moderately long series. Um, the order that theology is presented in is also different. And one of the things that we don't we don't often really think about is that something like the Westminster Confession or the Westminster Catechisms, the longer and shorter catechism, really any work of comprehensive theology is building an argument. And so there's a reason why chapter one of the Westminster Confession is the first chapter and why chapter two is the second chapter. There's a theological and a logical argumentation that is being embedded in the fact that chapter one is on scripture and chapter two is on the nature of God, right? Right. And that's not to say that it's right or wrong to start with the doctrine of God versus the doctrine of scripture. Actually, if I was writing a systematic theology, I would have, I would start with the doctrine of God. And there are plenty of really good systematic theologies, institutes of the Christian religion being one of them, that right. starts with the doctrine of God and doesn't address the doctrine of Scripture till later. So the fact that the Scots Confession starts with the nature of God and embeds into the nature of God that we particularly as um, as his image bearers, although it doesn't use this language, but we particularly as image bearers owe him allegiance and are to cleave to him. That is a significant feature. And we're going to see throughout this confession, the order that theology is presented in is actually remarkably different. I don't mean like remarkably, like really, really different, but it's worth noting and worth remarking on where there are differences in the order of this. There are sections of this confession that don't have direct equivalents in the Westminster Confession of Faith or in the Belgic Confession. So I think this is one of those things where this is part of our heritage and it influenced many of the many of the people who 
uh, who drafted and ratified and signed the Westminster Confession. It influenced many of those people in a very deep way, right? So we haven't spent a lot of time probably reflecting on it, and I think it will do us all a lot of good to do that. So I'm super excited for this series. I'm really excited to start digging into it. I'm really, really excited to see what God has for us. I, I We've been doing this long enough that I've learned that once we start a series, I should anticipate that God is going to do something in my life. Yeah, it sounds sure. like super charismatic and super like, I don't know, super like woo woo of me. But when we start a series, I can look back now at enough of the series we've done that I can, I can anticipate that God is going to do something surprising in my life and in my personal piety as we work through this. And I'm starting to get like excited. I, I want to run through a wall, Jesse. I actually yeah. just read that passage in the scripture and it's not but through a wall. It's like I could run against a troop and I can yes. jump over a wall. Yes. So I'm ready to run, uh, to jump over a troop and run <laughs> through a wall uh, and, and whatever that might mean. But I'm really stoked to work through this. So we may not go directly through it. We may take little breaks here and there to address a listener question or to do some other subject or if there's right. some sort of like current event topic that we need to cover and it's time sensitive or time related, we might do that. But we're going to be in the Scots Confession for a little while. So if you're looking for a good... Uh, a good version of the Scots Confession. You can get it from the Free Church Continuing in Scotland. The one caveat to this, and this is why I had to email Jesse a copy of this from my version of Logos rather than email him to it, is that the Free Church of Scotland shuts down their entire website on the on the Sabbath. So you can't even access the Confession of Faith on, on Sunday. So uh, it's, it's available in lots of places. Um, I think this is a really great confession for us to spend some time in and to really think through. I'm really looking forward to it. And this series, like all the series that we put together, is available for everybody to enjoy. So we encourage you to grab a copy of it, chat with a friend, make this an excuse to have coffee or conversation. And if you've ever wondered, how is it possible that all this stuff just exists there out on the interwebs, like no payroll, paywalls, no advertisements? You know, that's because there's so many brothers and sisters that give just a little bit to make sure that the podcast remains free because while it's not as annoying and cumbersome as purchasing real estate, there are fees for hosting and processing. <laughs> All of this actually, believe it or not, in this day and age, while it seems like everything is free, costs some money. That's so true. if you would like to participate in making sure and you receive some kind of blessing from these conversations, not from us, but from the Lord, then we would love for you to just process and come alongside and help us out with a little bit of a financial giving after you've satisfied all your responsibilities. And to that end, I want to personally thank brother Jason who came on board, went to patreon.com and said, you know what? I want to make sure that the podcast remains free. That again, like just like Jericho, he's tearing down the walls and making sure that there are no pay barriers so that everybody can have access to it. So thank you brother Jason, for coming along and saying, you know what, I want to give some to make sure that it happens. There's also another way to participate in giving, and that is we actually have, if you go to reformbrother.com, like a, just a fun little store out there. We have a couple of items that you can purchase. This is not because we drastically and dramatically want to sell you anything, but mainly because that's just another way to give. People from time to time say, hey, do you have anything? Like, I'd love to advertise or support the podcast by wearing your faces emblazoned across my chest because that would just, you're so handsome and that would just make me really feel great about my life. If that's you, you can do that too. And I just want to thank brother Christopher who was like, you know what, listen, I would love to have our firm brotherhood t-shirt. And when he and others purchase t-shirts like that, part of the proceeds go to support the podcast again, to make sure yeah. that it's free of charge for everybody. So brother Jason, and brother Christopher, thanks for doing your thing, getting in there in the mix. We see you, we appreciate you, and we love all our brothers and sisters who are participating in the Telegram chats, who are giving large and small, who are just part of the conversation, who email us, who bring forward topic ideas, or just want to chat about what's going on, about how to better follow closely after our Lord Jesus Christ. We are so grateful in many ways. It's exceeded what Tony and I set out to begin with, which was it was a conversation between us and what we found is that there's so many other people that are just like us that want to make sure that we serve God faithfully, that we cleave to him, that we trust in him, that we follow him, that we love him. So this Scott's Confession series is just another in a long line that's been brought to you by other brothers and sisters that said, hey, listen, I can make sure that this goes out into the world 
free of charge. Yeah. And the other thing that you can do if you want to help us out is to share this show with your friends. So we, we don't spend, we spend $0 on advertising. Um, we're not even on social media anymore and yet somehow the podcast seems to continue to grow and we we hear about new listeners and new people. And that only happens because people share the podcast with other people. And although this is very strange, but in an imminently humbling, we do hear from time to time that people like do study groups and they use the, the episodes that we've done or parts of the episodes that we've done to sort of launch their study groups or to sort of serve as like an introduction to things. You know, the Scott's confession is a great thing to study. So yeah. if, if you have a, a group of people that are wanting to get into theology or you have a group of friends that are, are eager to understand what the Lord teaches in the scriptures, it, this is a good place to start. The, a new series is a great place to introduce someone to the show. Um, the Scott's Confession is a great thing that you could work through with a group of Christian brothers or sisters. Uh, at, I don't know if you want to meet at your local Starbucks. I don't know why Starbucks is the place that Christians <laughs> feel like they need to meet to do Bible studies and stuff. But if you want to meet at Starbucks and talk about theology, this would be a great way to introduce someone to the show. So I would encourage you, if you're a listener and you like what we've got going, if you if you don't feel like you can contribute financially or that's just not your jam, uh, I would love if you would send a link to this episode or to this series to someone that you think might be interested. Because we do want to uh, we do want the gospel to get out. And although this is not a ministry in a capital M sense, this is a ministry in the lowercase m sense. And we do want people to hear what God has to say. So if you're able to contribute financially, that helps us keep things running smoothly. It helps us keep things uh, running without ever having to put up a paywall or take on weird sponsorships. But also we don't have to spend money on advertising if you guys are our advertising. So share this episode with a friend. If it's something that you think would edify them, we would really appreciate that as well. So to summarize, here's what we've learned on this 390th episode of the Reform Brotherhood. First, we've learned that the Scots Convention could have a lot of good stuff for us. Maybe even will spin us around, disorient us, give us a little bit of discomfort with maybe the things we're used to seeing in particular orders. And that will give us reason to ponder and consider a new, even theology that seems, you know, plain and normative to us. So I think that's a good thing. We also learned that Tony is now a property owner and that that's a fantastic thing. We've also learned that my bedroom door will open on its own accord and like open wide and will just make a massive creaking sound. And last but not least, we've learned that if for some reason you're lacking t-shirts, you can go to reformbrotherhood.com <laughs> and purchase some with our faces. But of course, most of all, we've always learned that until next time, you should honor everyone. Love that brotherhood. Oh.